views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 50th annual Herbert H. Lehman Memorial Lecture. As many of you know, during this past academic year, Lehman College has been celebrating its 50th anniversary, half a century of serving the Bronx as an intellectual, economic, and educational hub. During this anniversary year, I've had many opportunities to reflect on our mission and the role the campus community has played in the borough it calls home. And I have been honored to tell the story of Lehman College, about how we are recognized on the national stage as a catalyst for economic and social mobility, about the values of justice and equity that we hold so dear, and about our commitment to deepen our roots in the Bronx. I've also had occasion to pay tribute to our college's namesake, Herbert H. Lehman, who regardless of the leadership platform from which he led, he led with integrity, compassion, and a strong regard for the promise of a healthy democracy. As governor of New York, Herbert H. Lehman, in the midst of the Great Depression, turned a budget deficit into a surplus while pushing through social reforms we now take for granted. Minimum wage, unemployment insurance, senior age benefits, public housing, civil rights, medical care for the disabled, and laws to protect workers. As director of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, Herbert H. Lehman led the largest international relief effort in history, 24 million tons of food, clothing, and medical supplies to 500 million victims of world war. As a United States Senator from New York in 1950, Herbert H. Lehman voted against popular back then, and perhaps today, anti-immigrant legislation. And then he fought McCarthyism. His Senate colleagues told him at the time he was committing political suicide. But Herbert H. Lehman held his ground, stating that he would not compromise with his conscience, but would instead cast his vote to protect the liberties of our people. And so it is that today we gather to celebrate one of the most enduring traditions in this house of higher learning, the annual Lehman Lecture, where we celebrate the life and achievements of Herbert H. Lehman by listening to prominent individuals discuss local, national, and international matters that are timely and thought-provoking. The inaugural Lehman Lecture was held in 1970. It was delivered by former United States Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who oversaw the drafting of two of our nation's most significant pieces of legislation, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Since then, the Lehman Lecture has been delivered by elected officials, diplomats, artists, writers, and scientists who come to our campus to call attention to issues that make us reflect, that force us to confront not our differences, but our similarities, and seek to galvanize us to better use our time as citizens of the world to fight Governor Lehman's fight for justice, humanity, and equity. And we continue this tradition today as we welcome the Honorable Alessandra Villaggi, who represents who represents the 34th District in New York State Senate and is our Herbert H. Lehman College's Senator. Thank you for being with us today. Her widely... Her widely publicized Against All Odds victory showcased her ability to mobilize a community that felt ignored, and her campaign today serves as an inspiring example of grassroots organizing. After Senator Biagi took office, her candid revelation as a survivor of sexual abuse put the issue front and center in our state capital. 
She's wasting no time fighting for immigrants, health care, and women's rights. Her address today, entitled Courage, Disruption, and Resilience, Transformational Politics in the State of New York, will, I am sure, give us a great deal to consider during these very turbulent and uncertain political times. So now, please join me in welcoming to this podium a most inspiring and formidable leader, the Honorable Alessandra Biaggi. started on my remarks, I have to say, and I think that this is a great place to begin, um, about being vulnerable. Um, every time I hear um, about some of the things that I've done in our state's capital, I think, how, how, did, I, how did that happen? How did I do that? Like, who is that person talking about? Because it never stops being scary. It just doesn't. But that is where the work is, and that is where the work must begin. So I want you to all to know that. Let's begin. Um, let's begin by first thanking Lehman College for having me here and welcoming me back. Let's begin by thanking President Cruz and also um, congratulating President Cruz on his new position as the Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost. Which for those of you who don't know, it's the number two position in the entire CUNY system. And we not only want to thank him for his work um, and for building and growing Lehman College, um, but we want to assure him, of course, that we expect him to keep Lehman at the top uh, of his list and the, and the Bronx at the top of his list in his new job. Thank you to the members also of the President's Cabinet here with us today, including, in no particular order, Ronald Bergman, Susan Ebersole, Don Ewing Morgan, Jonathan Gagliardi, Jose Magdaleno, Gladys Maldoon, Peter Wosu, Rene Rotolo, Rini Sarmiento, S. Tulier, as well as the Lehman Foundation Board Chair, Dennis Gleason, and Alumni Advisory Board President, Diane Joy. Before we get into the next set of thank yous, I wanna just also thank all of you for taking the time today to be here, to listen to this message, to listen to these words, and to my team, who worked and works tirelessly to make sure that I can present the ideas and visions that will actually allow us to transform our government and our state, and to my family who is sitting in the front row here today, my mom who is a Lehman College graduate, my dad Richard, and my fiance Nathaniel. And thank you to all of my constituents for trusting me, really, with the privilege of being able to serve you each and every single day. I am humbled and honored and in awe that I am standing here with all of you today. And you've heard it from President Cruz, but I follow in the footsteps of so many smart and thoughtful leaders who have stood here to share their ideas in this setting for how we can transform our world. So before we get into the message, let's begin with a blessing, which is actually the way that I ended um, my last time here. Um, and it's with a poem by Cleo Wade. Um, her words are important for so many reasons, um, but mainly because her words demonstrate um, why it is important to shine light in the dark places with our words and with ourselves and why it's important not to stay silent. So here it is. The time is always right to begin. The time is always right to embrace your path, to accept what you had to walk through yesterday and what you must step away from now as you move toward tomorrow. The time is always right to pound your chest, yes it is, and let them know that you are here. 
to let them know that they will hear you, to let them know that they will see you. The time is always right to end your silence, to look at the person next to you and tell them to end their silence too. The time is always right to reclaim your narrative, to tell your story, to live with wild freedom in a place that asks you to control not only the way you see the world, but the way you see yourself. Now is the time, beloved. Now is the time. So, as we near the end of my first legislative session, I have had the opportunity to reflect on the journey that brought me right here before all of you today. I had the great fortune of growing up in a politically active family, which many of you may know and may not know, but you're about to hear about it if you don't. <laughs> my great grandparents came, like many people, from Italy to Ellis Island, a journey that was well known to many who still live in our district today. And legend in my family has it that my great-great-grandmother came to the United States with nothing more than a jacket, with a stick of salami in one pocket and some cheese in the other pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Food would be the language of love spoken in their home. And during the Great Depression, where resources were scarce, the ability to place a warm meal on the evening dinner table became a great source of pride. The dinner table became the battleground for debate, where the women played cards while the clothes were drying on the line, where loss was grieved, and where the grit to survive truly was born. Unemployment, growing to about 25% nationwide, my family, the Biagi family, found themselves at the epicenter of the depression's wake. Poor, and without connection to the existing, albeit small, group of New York political power brokers, every individual of the Biagi family went to work, including my grandfather, Mario, who was very small at the time. Six years old at the time, he would rise before the sun, and he would travel from his apartment in East Harlem to the highest trafficked subway station. And it was there that he would earn a few cents, and if he was lucky, he would earn a nickel to shine the shoes of those lucky men traveling to work. But it dawns on me now, and it dawns on me as I was thinking and reflecting on this, that it was very likely that many of those men traveling did not have a job. And that was probably the reason why my grandfather had a low profit in that pursuit of his job and work. But one day, fed up with the overcrowding of shoe shiners at his stop, and hell-bent on making the most profit, he sought a better and different route. I'm certain that this is the exact moment the Biagi competitive streak was born. <laughs> so, exhausted and awaiting the morning rush, he decided that he would just take a rest on a coal barge in New York Harbor. But when he woke up, he was panicked, and that was because the ship had set sail. And <laughs> he feared um, that he would never see his family again, which is a probably very reasonable fear. But luckily, the ship stopped in Long Island City, and upon landfall, he ran all the way home to East Harlem. <laughs> Except the story doesn't stop here. Later, at that same dinner table that I mentioned earlier, my grandfather learned that his father, my great-grandfather, Salvatore, who was a marble setter, was out of work. And he had one final plea for employment. My, gra my great grandfather, Salvatore, knew that politicians could help their constituents find work. And so he traveled from his apartment in East Harlem to the Democratic Club down the street. He got all dressed up, he was ready to go, and he arrived eager and hopeful to meet with the club's leaders. And when he was finally called out of the crowd of men who were waiting, he told them he needed their help finding work. He explained that he had three young children at home, he had a wife at home, and that he needed to house and to feed them, just like every one of us. They waited until he finished, and in response to him, they said, no Italians are welcome here. Please leave. That devastatingly painful response, I believe, is the exact moment that altered the course of all of our lives. And when that story was shared with me, so many years later, as a young girl around 
our family's Sunday dinner table, it became the driving force against injustice and one of the many reasons I am certain that I am standing before all of you here today. My grandfather Mario grew up from that challenging time and he served the people of New York for over 60 years. First as a police officer in the New York Police Department and later for nearly two decades as a congressman from the Bronx. Thank you. Growing up, I remember all of the times that we would sit around my grandmother Marie's dining room table in Riverdale and discuss the key issues. And no matter the topic of conversation, I was always made to feel that my thoughts mattered, that I was being listened to, and that I was heard. I was able, because of that family dynamic, to see firsthand the ways that I could help. Big and small, it didn't matter. And the ways in which courage, disruption, and resilience come together to transform our political landscape and ensure that there's really fair and just representation. I learned so many things from my grandfather, but from my grandfather's gun battle in the car where the chances of him living were so slim to none that he used the only thing that he had and was able to, to, to have before him, which was that he was left-handed. That became an advantage in that situation, and it saved his life. He was shot 10, shot and stabbed, excuse me, 10 times in the line of duty, and because of his bravery, when he retired from the New York Police Department, he was honored as one of the most decorated police officers in NYPD history. As a congressman, he used his voice to highlight injustice and oppression when it was not popular to do so, and this is where I realize that we are very much aligned. Um, one specific story that he shared with me is allowing me right now in this position to truly appreciate um, how much courage it takes to be able to speak the truth and to change the status quo. When the fight for uh, the peace in Northern Ireland broke out, many United States leaders were very silent. You may know this. Um, the fight was between the Catholics and the Protestants, and it had gone really too far. Too many lives were being lost. And he was eager to help. So he established the Ad Hoc Committee on Irish Affairs in Congress, and he fought hard on behalf of the Irish Catholic minority in Northern Ireland, arguing for basic human rights to be recognized and for a united Irish Republic. Doesn't seem too controversial, but at the time it was incredibly controversial. In fact, so much so that the Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, who wanted nothing more than for him to disappear and go away um, and to stop bringing awareness to this issue, uh, called him a terrorist. This was challenging, and it was even an unpopular uh, position to take, but the courage that he had was later recognized when he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts, losing only to Anwar Sadat. He never forgot the people he represented, though, either, and these bold actions were juxtaposed with the stories about the hours and hours and hours he spent each week listening to constituents and taking constituent cases at his district office in the Bronx. And to this day, I still hear those stories, but this time, they're shared by my constituents who remember my grandfather and hope that I will be the same way and show up for them like he did for them in the past. I carry the depth of these stories and so many stories that my grandfather shared with me over the years. And whenever the opportunity to speak up against injustice arises, the answer, despite the high possibility of disrupting the status quo or creating incredible discomfort or, quite frankly, honor, uh, not honor, anger, <laughs> honor, I wish it were that, anger amongst our state's leadership, it always, the answer is always yes to speak up. I recognize that my experience is unusual, that most people don't have a family member who served in Congress. But without this unique insight into the vast world of politics, I can understand how daunting it may seem to find your place within it. There are too many walls that are put up. I understand why it's hard to feel inspired to participate in politics when it often feels like our voices are not welcome. Our political processes are plagued by the corrupting influence of large corporate donors and special interests who often do not align with the needs and the values of the rest of our community, especially our community in the Bronx. I understand that the challenge of speaking up can be daunting when it doesn't feel as though the people in positions of power are really listening, because for a long time they haven't been. 
And in our government's current state, there are barriers in place that continue to limit the full participation of communities in our democracy. We see them every day, everywhere you look. And I'm sure that many of you know them well. Systematic voter suppression, targeted at New Yorkers in marginalized communities who most need their voices heard. A history of racist policies that have led to mass incarceration and a crisis amongst the criminal justice system, criminalizing our neighborhoods and communities of color, criminalizing poverty, and our gutted civic education budgets. All of these barriers, collectively, and there are so many more, prevent us from accessing our fundamental right to have our voices heard. And quite frankly, I don't blame you. Why would anybody want to get involved in a system that doesn't value your voice, that doesn't speak your language, that isn't reflective of your values, that doesn't look or feel or sound like you? I am not, however, shy. And I, I don't shy away from challenges. And I think that the truth today and every day as public servants and as a citizen is that my job is to elevate your voices and elevate the voices of our community. That is what the definition of being a public servant is. It is not putting yourself first, it is putting the people that you represent first. So how does this play out? Okay. Each week, as I make my journey up the New York State Thruway to our state's capital, I arrive to be joined by a collective of 63 other state senators from around our state. 39 of us make up the majority conference, and together we gather around a very large wooden table. It's not very fancy, actually. It's like a folding table. Um, and we sit in black rolling chairs, and we discuss our state's most pressing issues. Each individual representative, each state senator, sits at that table as one individual, doing their best to closely and accurately speak for the needs of over 300,000 constituents. Collectively, we sit in that room as 39, but we bring with us the voices of almost 12.5 million New Yorkers. This is one of the main, main and many reasons why I'm here to remind every single person in this room, every single person who is listening, the incredible need for your voices and why your voices matter. They are needed more than ever. They are needed, and we need to hear from you. For those of us who are awake, it's also our responsibility to awaken our neighbors, our families, our friends, and yes, and I say this wholeheartedly, even our elected leaders, because we don't know everything. <laughs> don't let them try to tell you that they do. The light in each one of our voices is that spark that is needed to identify injustice and propose solutions. This is where courage shows up. That child we see playing in the street with broken glass or plastic bottles, that group of teenagers we hear on the sixth train making fun of someone who is simply trying to do their best to get by, that small business owner on White Plains Road who's targeted because the god that they worship is different than others, we speak for all of them. These are the stories that carry with them the possibility for change change in our policies, change in our laws, and ultimately change in our culture, which inevitably will transform, we know, the lives of all of us. The individuals who are brave enough to speak out at these moments will define our collective consciousness. They will define the fate of our culture. They will determine the fate of our community. As David Brooks writes, these individuals are the fearless weavers seeking to live in right relation with others to serve the community good. They are not motivated by money or power and status. While undeniably beautiful, weavers underscore our moral problem. And as Brooks so eloquently states, we all create a shared moral ecology through the daily decisions of our lives. When we stereotype, abuse, impugn motives, and lie about each other, we ripped away at the social fabric and encouraged more ugliness. When we love each other across boundaries, listen patiently, even though that can be very hard, see deeply and make someone feel known, we've woven it and reinforced generosity. Many of us have been in these fights for a very long time, and the Bronx has a very proud tradition of activism for as long as we all can remember and probably for even longer. 
It's a cultural currency um, that has grown out of some of the most challenging socio-political situations. Hip hop. One of the most influential cultural developments in the world was born right here in the Bronx. The response to the Bronx is burning in the 70s and the 80s. Tenant organizing and advocacy rose up across the borough. Silence breaker and civil rights activists from the Bronx, Tarana Burke, founded the Me Too movement. The Bronx has been in this fight since its inception. So it's not a surprise that the epicenter for change right now in this country is in this borough. And it is birthed out of this borough. But many others have reached this realization in the past few years, and more New Yorkers continue to wake up, and that's a good thing. They wake up more and more every day. Many people are beginning to have conversations that they never even thought they would have before. Families and neighbors are forming new relationships based on their collective values and what their community needs. It's basic, unmet needs. We're seeing more people entering the political arena, which is a good thing. We are seeing people who are learning how to use their voices, even if they begin and they don't know how. And we have to be attentive to those voices. We have to foster them. We have to elevate them. We have to encourage them. And we have to work with them to impact those who have yet to realize their power and their potential, because every single one of us has that ability to wield that power. This is how we can instill change into an active part of our culture. We find ourselves in a truly interesting time, and we have so much promise, so much abundance, so much knowledge, so much magic at our fingertips. All of you have cell phones. If you hold your cell phone, the amount of information contained that you can get to in that phone is unending. It's, it, is, it is limitless, and yet we're burdened significantly by structural, systemic, racial, economic, and gender-based oppression. We lived in a society that is deeply unequal. And I don't say that to depress us, but it is just the truth. And paradoxically, we live in a society that is deeply connected and has left us, however, spiritually and politically disconnected and more divided than we have ever been before. Too many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives, the physical world that we live in, and the spaces that we have access to are determined by these forces of oppression. So let me name a few. The schools where our, ch our children are educated, the jobs we work to earn a living, how and where we buy our food, the quality of our health care that we receive, whether we have health insurance even at all, some of us don't, and even if we do, we still find that we can't have all of our needs met. These are all steeped in structural bias and inequality. Many of these unjust social systems were designed intentionally, from redlining to segregationist housing and education policy, while others have been perpetuated subconsciously. And perhaps that is maybe the most devastating. These systems, in small ways and in large ways, still carry the codes of racial and economic oppression of erasure, of injustice. They have not yet been fully updated to be modern or to be just. We have also to acknowledge that hate remains far too present in our society. Racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia and Islamophobia Bigotry in all of its forms are on the rise. And so our work has never been more important to both fight back against these forces of hate, against white supremacy, against the deep systems of inequality and oppression that allow that very hate to grow. Our work together, arm in arm, because I can't do this alone. <laughs> must be to reinvent these systems and to transform them. It's our work to make the world more just. It is literally up to us. And I see my role as a public servant serving all of you and this community to first and foremost galvanize and unleash the power of the community even if it scares the people in charge. And to be a staunch advocate for all of your priorities and for the priorities of my constituents because their voices have gone unheard for way too long and that alone feels oppressive. 
Our project is a big one. When we think about the scale of the changes that have to be made, the systems that we have to transform, it actually sometimes does feel impossible because we're one person and the issues are everywhere. But we can, but we can do it. These transformational goals should not lead us to overlook the everyday acts, big and small, that we can and already are taking to make our communities a better place and our world more just. Change can begin when a group of young people decide to organize a town hall at their school about racism and invite their representatives as the students of the Collegiate Institute for Math and Science at Columbus High School just did last month. Change can begin when a school district decides to recognize and uplift everyday acts of kindness and create the Kindness Awards as District 8 did earlier this year. Change can begin when a person writes to their legislature about a problem they're experiencing. And yes, change can begin when a group of citizens get together and decide to begin an indivisible group or a civic association, or hold a tenant meeting in their lobby of their apartment building to work together to demand that the representation they need is not, is not currently in place and they're gonna fight hard to make sure that it happens. These acts of change, small and large, and I will say this over and over again, small and large, because it all matters. It, they are important beyond measure. We should not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the enormity of the task ahead, even if we do feel overwhelmed in some moments. Even if one person's life is made better, our, our effort is worthwhile. Civic responsibility is rooted in these acts of kindness every day. Building a more just society is not only about system-wide change. Do we speak up when we see an injustice? Do we help our neighbors in their times of need? Do we amplify voices that may not be as loud as our own? That sort of devotion to helping others is what social justice is all about. It is a deep compassion, compassion for and commitment to each other. And that is where we begin. Sometimes it is putting others' needs before our own. That is very hard in a, in a society that focuses on the individual, but it is the beginning and it is the truth. These same principles underscore true committed public service and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. We also need to remember that as strong as the institutional and structural forces may be, they too, wait for it, were made by people. And they can be taken down and put back together by people too. We have the power, we, we, all of us, have the power to change them. The, the moment that we realize that the world is ours to shape, and it sounds cliche and I understand that, but it, it quite literally is the truth that so many people don't want you to know or realize. Not just to look upon our society and want it to be better, but to commit ourselves to creating the crucial changes that we collectively deserve. That same spark lies at the core of amazing art of entrepreneurship, of invention, of organizing and political movements. It's the core of what moves us forward and I'm here to remind you and myself too, because I do need to be reminded, that you all have access to it. The good news or the bad news, depending upon how you're feeling today, is that there is no shortage of work to be done. We need better systems everywhere. That is the work of social justice. But let's not forget those small, everyday acts of change I have mentioned. We all have the capacity to make a difference. So how do we create change? Well, as I'm sure you've realized, the title of this discussion is Courage, Disruption, and Resilience, Transformational Politics in the State of New York. It's a very long title. I'm very proud of it. But what does it really actually mean? <laughs> These ideas, courage, disruption, resilience, they capture how I think about the world and my position every day, creating change as one individual, as part of a body, as part of the collective, as part of being a citizen. Because again, don't let any elected tell you that they're not a citizen, they're still citizens, just like all of us. And I believe that this is how we create change. So I want to talk about each of these principles and highlight some of the extraordinary people and movements who have embodied these ideas because we all stand on their shoulders and they're the reason whether we 
see it or not, that we are able to engage in these fights. And it's up to us to carry on their work through our courage and our disruption and our resilience, as challenging and uncomfortable as it can be. Courage, truly defined, is the audacity to stand strong in your convictions and speak your truth no matter the outcome. It's no easy thing. Last March, students around District 34 and the Bronx worked together to organize walkouts to commemorate and stand in solidarity with the victims of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. At Grace H. Dodge Career and Technical School, not very far from here actually, students added calls for fewer metal detectors and more social workers and counselors to their protest of gun violence. Think about that. That is wise beyond measure. These student activists stood up for what they believed. Since then, they have held strong to their convictions and they've organized activist groups to not only combat gun violence, but to raise awareness amongst their peers and amongst their elders. The seven women who make up the sexual harassment working group are another example of courage. Together, Erica Vladimir, Eliana Kaiser, Leah Herbert, Daniel Bennett, Danielle Bennett, excuse me, Rita Passarell, and Elizabeth Carruthers have fought to change the conversation and shift the status quo in Albany. That is not an easy thing. And it's because of their work and my work with them that this session, we have held the first hearing on sexual harassment in Albany in 27 years. <laughs> And it's just the beginning because this month, on May 24th, we will hold another hearing in New York City. These hearings would never have happened, never have happened, if it were not for their bravery and their dedication to the message and making sure that they were empowering the victims of sexual abuse and sexual harassment in the workplace. And in sharing their stories, the members of the Sexual Harassment Working Group are fighting so that there are not only better processes and awareness, but that we have stronger laws in place so that people don't have to continue to face oppression and hostility and harassment in the workplace. They're raising their voices, as challenging and scary as it is, as much pushback as they've received, so that others do not have to feel the same pain. That is a deeply courageous and selfless act. Disruption. It is the acknowledgement of flawed systems and the willingness to push boundaries and to change the conversation. I'm sure that every single person in this room is a disruptor or you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Bella Abzug was a disruptor. She was born right here in the Bronx. And Bella served three terms in Congress. But first and foremost, she was a feminist. She was an anti-war activist. She ran her first campaign for Congress under the slogan, this woman's place is in the House. The House of Representatives. <laughs> once, when, when she was finally and once elected, she never doubted her place, which is stunning, truly. Bella always did what she believed was right, whether or not it was politically expedient or the way things were usually done. And in the 1970s, she introduced legislation to expand rights for gays and lesbians. She fought for greater transparency in government. She championed something called the Sunshine Law, which requires now requires our government to make government hearings open to the public. To think that that wasn't something that was already in place is actually stunning. But it's amazing that she was the one to make sure that it happened, and not surprising. Geraldine Ferraro summed up Bella's style best by saying, let's be honest about it. She did, knock, she did not knock politely on the door. She took the hinges off. <laughs> Disruption comes from lots of sources. And as I mentioned earlier, hip hop, right? It was born as an act of disruption in the South Bronx. Early pioneers invented new musical techniques for sampling and breakbeats, playing around with different types of records at the time. It was a very unusual way of doing music. They incorporate diverse sounds and origins in their work, creating many new forms of expression. 
including breakdancing, which I'm sure many of you know about. But these artistic achievements, they're remarkable in their own right because they were born out of probably some of the toughest conditions in neighborhoods that were the most neglected uh, by their elected officials, by their leaders, and by city servants. Hip hop, in its own right, created a new language of expression. These early artists were disruptors. They may not have served in the halls of Congress or fit the traditional mold of change agents, but they changed their communities and they changed the world of music and ultimately American culture forever. Resilience. Resilience is the capacity to be bold, to not back down in the face of significant obstacles or to be thrown by setbacks. And we've had many of them since 2016. Noel Santos. Noel Santos embodies resilience. Just last month, Noel opened an independent bookstore in the Bronx, currently the only bookstore in the Bronx. In 2014, when the Barnes and Noble decided to shut its doors, which I'm sure many of you know about and were saddened by, Noel made it her mission to open a bookstore of her own. She found out about a class for booksellers and combined with her vacation and her sick days, she went to Florida to take a class about this specific topic. And in 2016, she won the New York Public Library's startup competition, giving her a little money to start up her idea. Through crowdfunding and a campaign to raise awareness, aptly called Let's Bring a Goddamn Bookstore to the Bronx, <laughs> she raised $170,000. Just a few weeks ago, the bookstore, which is called Lit Bar, opened representing a culmination of her years of advocacy and leadership, and we are so proud of her and so happy to have her in this world. <clears throat> there were so many points, I'm sure, because this is always the way, um, at which Noel could have given up, right? But she never did. She identified that there was an unmet need in her community and she committed and vowed to doing something about it. Khalif Browder's family is another example of resilience. Khalif died at the hands of, wrongful, of the wrongful criminal justice system after his three years of unjust imprisonment at Rikers Island, which is in my district. Khalif's family would have been justified wholeheartedly to withdraw and to mourn their loss. But instead, they chose to organize and to fight. They chose to use the terrible and the unjust experience of their son and their brother to demand reform of bail, open discovery, and to advocate for the end of the use of solitary confinement. I am incredibly proud to say that this year in the New York State budget, we have achieved bail reform and discovery reform and have changed the rules about speedy trials that should prevent more tragic cases like Khalif's because of what his family has chosen to do. But there's still more work to do about solitary confinement. Akeem Browder, Khalif's brother, is also working to bring conversations about social justice into the classroom. He created a game called Keep It Real that helps people engage in conversations about injustice. And last month, we were very lucky for him to stop by my district office to share the game with my team. Akeem chose to view the tragedy of his brother's death as an opportunity to shine a light in the dark and unjust halls of our criminal justice system. This is a transformation of suffering into positive social change. And it has risen the collective conscious in such a powerful way that an entire generation cannot go back to sleep now. Together, the forces of courage and disruption and resilience lead us towards transformation. None of the examples that I just shared with you were easy. They were painstakingly difficult. But I know, and I believe deep down in my soul, that if we hold these ideas as our North Star, that change is not only possible, but it's probable. And if we commit to them fully, 
Change is inevitable, which is what we need. When I finally decided to run for office, I could not sleep for days because my mind was frantic with fear. Fear about every single thing you can possibly imagine. Fear of judgment, fear of making mistakes, fear of looking foolish, fear of wearing the wrong thing, fear of having high heels that were too high or too short, or putting my hair up or putting my hair down, or the color of my lipstick, fear of falling short, or worst of all, and most importantly, of letting people down. I will never forget the first time that I spoke in front of a group of people asking for their support. The first time I asked if they would donate to my campaign, my hands literally shook. I had a piece of paper in front of me. I looked down before saying a word, and I looked up and I said, hello. <laughs> my name is Alessandra Biaggi. Thank you for being here. It was absurd. <laughs> okay. My voice was unsteady, my heart raced, and it was actually wild. I had to go into the bathroom afterwards, cry for a little while, call my fiance, and then come back out and pretend like everything was wonderful. <laughs> but I pushed through it. I pushed through it, and I remained resilient, resilient because I knew that I'd rather fail at this very important thing than not even try at all. I knew, as I've said, and this is something that was born in this, this phrase I'm about to share with you was born in Riverdale, <laughs> that there was a win in the loss because we had the power to raise awareness around fundamental abuses of our government, abuses of the people's trust, and abuses of our democracy that had gone on for too long. For all the times that I was told that I was crazy or that I didn't have a chance, I marched forward with conviction that this campaign that I was running represented the opportunity to share an important message to voters and to individuals who were willing to wake up. And every time, a little aside, every time that we had a setback, I put on my sneakers, I laced them up, and I knocked on another hundred doors, and another hundred doors, and another hundred doors, and another few hours at the train station, because that is the way it's done, in inches. It's inch by inch by inch. For every no, not now, wait your turn, and here's my favorite one. How about running for this other seat here instead? That sounds good, you can start over here. I remained steadfast to my conviction that this was the race that had the potential to put an earth-shattering crack in the foundation of our Tammany Hall New York political machines, and that this race had the potential to begin to dismantle cynicism, which I blame for putting people to sleep in the first place, and to unlock a decade of blocked progress and bills. And every time I came home from those 14-hour days of canvassing and fundraising, utterly exhausted and, and literally wanting to give up, I heard the tenants' voices on Pelham Parkway. I heard them pleading with me to strengthen our rent laws. I heard the mothers at PS69 who were very proud of their school's progress. It's actually one of the best performing public schools in the Bronx, but they were worried still that their children wouldn't have the tools to be able to graduate and move on to have further success. I heard the seniors at the Riverdale Senior Services Center talk about their fixed incomes and how I could help them to reduce the cost of their prescription drugs. I heard Pearl Korn, who is a resident of Riverdale, plead with me to please pass the New York Health Act. I heard stories from women who lost their children to gun violence and stories of sexual abuse. I heard the voices of addicts who needed help, of the BX5 riders who were literally sick of waiting 90 minutes for their bus to come, from homeless families who needed housing, from the disabled who were prevented from actually riding the train like everyone else because of the lack of elevators at all of our train stations and the lack of ADA accessibility in our public transportation, which is unacceptable. And I refused to tell them no, and I refused to let them down. So I continued to wake up every single day vowing to work harder than the last, and that's probably where that competitive nature came back in, that I, I had to keep going, I had to keep going and knock on more doors. And I knocked on tens of thousands of doors myself. And that's not in including my entire team of over 500 volunteers who also did the same, until we ultimately added up those inches and we won. <laughs> that 
that's the core of courage. It's feeling that fear so deeply in your being, but acting anyway. And that's actually something that my grandfather would always say to me. He would say, you can be afraid, you're allowed to be afraid, but you're not allowed to back down. You have to keep going. Other aspiring public servants took on other members of the Independent Democratic Conference, and they pushed through their fear as well. We were rewarded for our courage. The state of New York has already changed significantly because of our courage, and the courage of those who took a chance on us, which is not easy, not easy, and supported our campaigns. And that was all in the face and fear of political retribution. That courage has translated into a disruptive force that has upended the business as usual power dynamics in Albany. That is a process that is ongoing, but I will tell you honestly that disruption, and in this case in particular, the, the way in which we're disrupting, it's not always fun. It can be <laughs> scary, um, it can be frustrating, it can leave, leave you wondering, which is all happening to me lately, like why did I ever decide to do this in the first place? This is insane. Um, it can leave people in very high positions very mad at you for pushing on that status quo. And that's because when you threaten the systems that have enjoyed, and enjoyed I think is the right adjective here, unquestioned power for a long time, they react with intimidation and with force. But when it is scary, we can take some comfort in knowing that those reactions are a sign, as hard as it may be to see this, that our disruption is working, that we are doing the work. And as it's shown up already in this short period of time that we've been in Albany, um, despite that, it is the literal reason why I believe um, I am here to do this job, to disrupt this system for the better. So, we're here today and overall because of small but very courageous acts, knocking on doors, right? Get a turf, knock on 20 doors. Talking to your neighbor, hey, do you know about this race that's happening? Do you vote? Are you gonna vote? Are you registered to vote? Making phone calls, hey, there's an election coming up. Do you know about that? We're here because people literally spoke up and they reached out to advocate for what is right. And the collective of that is, is what forced the change. It's been four months since this new class of representatives took office. So I wanna talk a little bit about what's different in New York due to our, effort, our efforts. We passed sweeping changes to New York's voting laws that will make it easier for people to cast their ballot. We created 10 days of early voting so that if you can't take time <laughs> off from work or get childcare on election day, you can vote another way. We consolidated our state and congressional primaries. So you only have to show up once if you want to vote in your party's primary, at least in non-presidential races. We took steps toward amending our constitution to allow 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote and to allow for no excuse vote by mail. Because let me just share with you that if you voted um, by absentee previously because you thought you'd be out of the state, and you wound up actually staying in the state that day. But you voted by absentee. That was considered a felony. That's insane, okay? We ch we're, we're on the path to changing that. To be really clear though, I know that we have more work to do in creating a robust public financing system, to passing automatic voter registration, to reform the whole holistic way of, of how our elections and voting work. But these changes will make it easier for more New Yorkers now to make their voices heard, and that's exactly what we should be doing every day. And the laws that we've passed thus far begin that hard work of fundamentally making our government more accountable and more accessible to all of us. Let's be clear, though. Increasing voter turnout is a long-term systemic task. Entrenched power and incumbents Benefit from low turnout and low profile races. The more people that vote, the more elected officials have to pay attention to their constituents. Imagine that. The reforms that we have already made, are, they're a critical first step, but they are just that. They're a first step. Much of the progress that we've made this session 
has been the culmination of years of efforts by activists and by my colleagues. One of the first bills that we passed this session was the Child Victims Act, um, which had languished in the Senate for years without being advanced. And let me just, an aside, when we voted on this bill, um, it was unanimous, which is even more infuriating if you can imagine that, but we, we persist. Um, it's <laughs> true. I, have, I shared this on the floor when we voted, but I am a, a survivor of child sexual abuse, and this bill was deeply personal to me, and I made the decision to share my story that day on the floor of the Senate when we passed the bill. I really did expect that I would be alone that day in sharing my story, but little did I know, my assembly sisters in the chamber down the hall were also sharing their stories of abuse. The Child Victims Act advanced by so, were advanced by so many acts of courage by my colleagues, by advocates, by other survivors of child sexual abuse who spoke up. And it was probably one of the most pivotal moments and transformative moments I think that that chamber has ever seen. Other bills, like the DREAM Act, right, which makes it easier for undocumented New Yorkers to go to college. And GENDA which banned discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression were also the product of years of activism and courage from out-of-status immigrants and the members of the LGBTQ community. These laws would certainly not have been passed without people coming forward and courageously sharing their stories, speaking their truths in the face of a, an incredibly significant imbalance of power. We also passed the Reproductive Health Act the Comprehensive Contraception Coverage Act, the Boss Bill, to ensure that women can access reproductive health care and make their own choices about their own bodies. <laughs> and we passed common sense gun safety measures because no one in New York should have to fear going to school or walking around their neighborhood or attending services at their place of worship enough. In this year's budget, we fought for increases in school funding to help to level the playing field. We did achieve a $1 million increase in overall school funding, but I'm not going to stand here and lie to any of you and say that I'm proud of the lack of increase in foundation aid funding, which we know is the actual line item in the budget that will allow for our public schools to have all of the resources that we need. That is absolutely unacceptable. And so we will keep fighting for more funding next year so we can continue to bridge the divide and bring greater resources to these schools in the most underserved communities. And we can talk about that another time, but what I will just say is that that specific area of our budget underscores the lack of attention and value that we have put in this state toward our education system as a whole. We reformed key aspects of New York's pretrial criminal justice system, as you heard me mention earlier, ending cash bail for nonviolent crimes, passing speedy trial reform, and requiring prosecutors during discovery to share the evidence they have with defendants early on so that we don't have individuals who are taking a plea deal simply because they don't have the information that they need to allow for exculpatory evidence to make them not guilty. We banned plastic bags to reduce the amount of single-use plastic over our state and, and with what our state consumes. And we took the first step. <laughs> And I don't expect an applause for this one, but this is a, this is a challenge. Uh, we took the first step with congestion pricing, which we, which we did because our transportation system has a lack of funding. And we have waited to, too long and gotten to the point where our subways are almost at a point where they can't work. And we can't let that happen in a place like New York City. And so we are going to build a, and build and improve a public transportation, transportation system that is including things like ADA accessibility and more elevators and making sure that we close the areas where there are transportation deserts so that we can build greater economic opportunity in all of our districts and not just in certain areas that get the most attention like Manhattan.
<laughs> we also held the first sexual harassment hearing, as I mentioned, in 27 years, bringing to light some critical issues about the inadequacy of the reporting mechanisms that are available in our state. This process and the, and the hearings and the discussions and the consultations that we had, I think is the only way that we ensure that we produce the best possible legislation to create a safe working environment for all New Yorkers. We, we as a state followed in the example of New York City, which held hearings that resulted in a lot of many important new rules and policies and structures, and in many ways we've modeled our, our approach after them. Sexual harassment is absolutely not an easy subject to discuss. It sometimes causes pain. Sometimes it makes people uncomfortable. I would probably argue that it's most of the time. Um, it creates lots of fear. And sometimes it creates uncertainty in language or how to talk about it, a feeling that we really might say the wrong thing, so we might as well just not talk about it at all. But it's essential that we provide a safe place for people to come forward and speak about their experiences. At the first hearing that we held, we heard from federal, state, and city agencies and the role that they play in the policy development and the enforcement, this is the key, the enforcement of workplace safety. Representative experts from advocacy organizations testified about the shocking nature um, of harassing behaviors, and they recommended different ways that we can strengthen policy and enact new legislation. Finally, and most powerfully, you've heard me speak about the sexual harassment working group, but we heard from individual witnesses, um, including the sexual harassment working group, who delivered testimony about their lived experiences of being subjected to sexual harassment while working in government. And it was incredibly clear that we, as a government, have failed them. And so this is our opportunity to make it right. There is an absolute lack of policy, of a reliable standard of reporting, and of structures that address these issues in trauma-informed ways. And so it's now our time to close these cr critical gaps and to make sure that we increase the ability for someone to know where they can even go to come forward and are able to report harassing behaviors. Throughout the hearing, witnesses exposed the grossly inadequate avenues of recourse available to them. And honestly, the widespread institutional failure to resolve these matters without subjecting them to further harm because there's retribution for those who come forward to talk about these things in the workplace, especially in a political environment where um, threats and bullying is the currency that is used, unfortunately. As I noted earlier, these hearings happened in large part because of the Sexual Harassment Working Group. And these seven women, all of them were former legislative staffers and tireless advocates who shared their stories of harassment by former members and former member staff about their abuse. They described the current system as difficult to navigate and slow to fully investigate allegations. But in total, we learned that New York State must do better. There is absolutely no excuse. The act of sexual harassment, of sexual abuse, goes back to one thing. It's about power. Systems that perpetuate the injustice and the neglect of silencing victims or enabling those who abuse to get away with it and to carry on without consequence, we see that very often. Those systems are part of a much larger power structure that must, must, must come to an end. And our job as legislators will be to determine how these systems work now and how we can effectively dismantle them with something more just and more healthy. But it is not an easy task at hand. We have to arrive at a place where every single state agency, both houses of the legislature and the executive branch, all have crystal clear, transparent protocols for how to report abuse and harassment, timely and transparent communication with the complainants, and a culture of support for victims and a zero tolerance policy for those who abuse. We must do that. We have to do that this year. We have
have to also make sure that everyone knows their rights and that the laws are clear for anyone who is found to have been harassed or abused by another person. This might not sound like it's disruptive, but it is. Because silencing, information, silencing people and keeping information in the dark is a way to keep people oppressed. And so that is why it is also up to us to share that information and to make it very clear where to go, what your, what your protections are, what the laws are, because that's one of the ways to chip away at the system. Our state government is the second largest employer in New York. And we have to do better by leading and setting the example straight. It's our job to have safer workplaces and make sure that they're safer than all others so that we can effectively set regulations for every single employer across this entire state. State senators like myself and members of the assembly and every other state employee must be held to the highest standards. I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I am pleading with you to please continue to do that. That hearing was one of the first acts of the Senate Ethics Committee, a body that I have the great honor of chairing. And we are renewing this committee, which is just one element of raising the bar for ethical conduct in Albany and across New York State. In fact, before I took on the position as chair of the Ethics Committee, the committee had not met in seven years. So we wonder why there's problems in Albany. Right, okay. <laughs> It's important that we get this right. So we'll be holding a second hearing, as I mentioned, in New York City on May 24th. And if there is anybody listening or watching who may not yet want to share their story or share another, share, share some other, someone else's story, that's okay. You can submit testimony. You can come forward. There is a mechanism to do that. And we will make sure that you have um, the clear instructions on how to participate, if you so wish. The only way to prevent further harassment is to use these hearings to consider the best way to hold people accountable, including ourselves and our colleagues. And we have to produce substantial legislation and policy to ensure that all of this is fully implemented. The first few months of our session have been simultaneously exhilarating and sobering. This legislative session has been unusually productive and even though we've passed bills that will change people's lives for the better, we still, again, have more work to do. Laws that were needed but were held up for years because of a little arrangement we all know was taking place for over 10 years. In sum, we showed that elections matter, that changing our representatives can actually make a real difference. And it's been a reminder of how far we still have to go and how much we're still fighting against and the need for resilience and determination. First and foremost, though, we need to continue to change the way that things work in Albany. Experiencing the New York State budget process uh, for the first time <laughs> made it clear to me how centralized the power in Albany is. And it was not fun. Because of a 2004 dis court decision, Silver v. Pataki, the budget process is so incredibly tightly controlled by the governor and the executive branch. And it's unfortunate that it's also soaked up with lobbyist influence. In fact, many things died this year because of special interests that could have actually benefited our state. Although the road to changing this budget process is very long, the first step is raising awareness. And so the fact that we are now even in conversation about something called Silver v. Pataki is an incredible place to be because we didn't really talk about this case. And in fact, even if we did, we were told to be quiet about it because we didn't want to upset anybody. But we have too much at stake. And it's an opportunity that we have to take now. New Yorkers would actually do much better if they were served by a budget process, much like what California does, not surprisingly, that gives more equal weight to their elected leaders and allows for the executive and the legislature to be on an equal playing field so that we are able to come to the table in a way that allows us to negotiate from an equal place. Creating a robust public financing system is another key step. The final budget created a commission that will make recommendations about public financing in December. I am not a fan of commissions. I think that commissions give away the power of the legislature to legislate, but here we are 
even though we spoke about it. I think the win is that it even ended up in the budget at all, and it's because of our small acts of courage in raising awareness about this specific topic. I'm gonna follow the process very closely with this commission because they will be creating, allegedly, a small donor matching system, um, which we know is probably one of the most important things in the state of New York to reduce and eliminate the power and negative influence of money in politics. And that act, which may seem small, will actually change the entire way that we do government and politics in the state of New York. It will also open up the doors for people who don't come from wealthy backgrounds to run for elected office. And it will incentivize our elected officials to li actually truly listen to their constituents, um, which has not happened, unfortunately, for far too long in the state of New York. It will quite literally disrupt the system in the best way possible by creating space for new voices. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. Making Albany a more transparent and equitable place will make it easier for progress to happen on issues that are facing everyday working people and workers across this entire state. So many of the system-wide changes that we need in our society from creating a single-payer healthcare system to combating climate change are opposed by the special interests that are currently the loudest voices in the room due to the most money and the power that they wield as a result of that. But in a world where elected officials actually answer specifically to the voters in their community, instead of the lobbyists and the special interests, positive change will become more likely. These changes will take a lot of time, but we will absolutely not lose heart, even if we want to go back into that bathroom and cry for a few minutes and then come back out. We have to keep showing up. The example of fair elections makes it clear how powerful the collective voices already are. Public financing by the way of small donor, by the way of a small donor matching system was not a mainstream idea in Albany a few years ago. Um, but again, the organizing of Let New York Vote and many, 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 many different groups of activists around the state put this issue on the map. Their phone calls and their emails to our offices during the budget process ensured that we wouldn't forget about public financing when it came time to vote on the budget. And without their activism, the budget might not have even included a public financing commission at all. So it's a remarkable move forward, even if it's not what we wanted ultimately to see. The work, though, is far from over. We have to continue to fight to make sure that we have an effective public financing program. These activists and their courage, though, should inspire all of us and should remind us that disruption is not always fast, but it's slow moving and that is just as powerful. I want to briefly mention some other pressing issues that are facing our community, beginning with higher education and our higher education system because that's fitting in the environment that we're in right now. While we are working to transform our world to make it more equitable to all, we also have to support and build those existing institutions that spread opportunity. The institution we are in today is an example, an important example of precisely that. CUNY in general and Lehman in particular have always been the university of the people. We know that to be the case. We know that in today's world, a college education can be the key to building a better life, the difference between living in poverty or in living in the middle class, and no school serves the people of this city more than CUNY. It's true. It serves a half million New Yorkers. Okay, 60% of its degree-seeking students have family incomes below $30,000 a year. Three quarters are people of color, 40% are immigrants. That is something to be celebrated. In District 34 alone, there are 7,500 CUNY students 1,674 of them go to Lehman College. Seven, yes. 
751 of CUNY's faculty and professional staff live in this district. 203 are low-wage adjunct professors. The key to an excellent education is excellent professors. And CUNY and the union that's representing its professors are without a contract. After this speech, I will be joining some Lehman professors and students to urge a good contract that guarantees CUNY and Lehman can continue to keep and attract the best professors. Here, let me just say that I hope the university and the union reach an agreement soon that best serves the interests of the students. And to be clear, I understand very fully and fully well that the state is responsible for funding and it's essential to the health of CUNY and Lehman College. And I will be in that room continuously making sure that that voice is heard. Healthcare. We must continue our commitment to combating the negative health outcomes that plague the Bronx. It's actually one of the most devastating set of statistics if you take a look at them. The Bronx has some of the highest asthma rates in all of the boroughs, and not only all of the boroughs, but in the nation. Some of the highest obesity rates in all of the five boroughs are here in the Bronx. And that's just the beginning of the issues that plague one of the most beautifully diverse districts in the entire country. Healthcare is a basic, human right, full stop. <laughs> and we have to expand quality access to every person in this state. We need a more equitable healthcare system that works for all of us and not just some of us. When we talk about health though, let's just be clear about a few things. We are talking about the social determinants of health. We're talking about access to healthy foods and to safe housing, about the poverty rate and educational attainment. All of that collectively make up the health of ourselves, of our communities, and whether or not our neighbor is well means that we will not be well. So we have to prioritize all of these things. We're talking about the air that we breathe. The fact that we are at a critical tipping point um, to be able to even see that we can implement single payer health care system um, means that we have a system that can support transformational change towards a racially, economically, and environmentally just society. And that is promising, but we have to keep pushing to take it over the finish line. The social issues that I've mentioned I want to also bring attention to economic issues and economic opportunity in the Bronx because they go hand in hand, in my opinion. I want to be on the record that as social justice champions, we should be advocates of helping fair and good businesses boom. I want to see a New York that is an undisputed leader that has vision in new industries that are anchored in things like science and technology, engineering and mathematics, and that will bring a treasure trove of benefits for our state and for all of our communities. These will be the industries undoubtedly, like personalized medicine, genomics, bioinformatics, excuse me, robotics and, and artificial intelligence, and the fact that we're gonna be transitioning away from um, regular jobs like driving a truck or, or being a toll driver to automated cars and to automated systems. This is the awareness that we need to bring to this innovative industry. It's meaningful work, it's modern work, and we have to engage in a dialogue. And I feel that we are at the moment where we can, but we are still talking about and fighting against meeting our basic needs, which is probably the most frustrating part of this entire um, system. But we have to be careful. We need to make sure that economic gains don't come at the expense of Bronx residents and communities like we've seen in other boroughs like Brooklyn and Williamsburg. We must apply our values so that capitalism works for us as humans, not the other way around. We should have incentives for companies to engage in profit sharing and to increase employee ownership in their firms. If we're strategic, we will find ourselves in a world of abundance. 
Finally, I want to say a few words about climate change. Unfortunately, climate change is at the backdrop against which everything else is taking place. So we have to talk about it. As community leaders, we can't ignore this. We have to be honest with people about what we are up against. The reality right now is that temperatures will rise and are rising. As it stands, we, are even, we aren't even close, <laughs> unfortunately, to being on track to averting these changes. And that has potentially devastating results. That is the truth. It pains me to say it, but it is the truth. What the world needs and what New York State needs, because we know that the world looks at New York State when it's making decisions, is an effort that is equivalent, dare I say it, to war. Marshalling all of our energy and our creativity to, transi to transition away from fossil fuels and other causes of climate change and to develop and deploy carbon capture technologies that can halt or even reverse some of the devastating effects of climate change in our communities. Right now, the fossil fuel interests and their allies in government are working effectively to stop our progress. So we have to work on two fronts. We have to organize to make that effort happen. And that is why I appreciate the work of Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and her allies in Congress and what they have done to raise awareness. But here in the Bronx, and as a state, and on the ground, we have to also make plans as a community so that we are able to change the direction of where our climate is headed. New York communities need detailed plans for how to build resilience in their economic systems, in their transit systems, in their energy systems, in their food systems, healthcare, all of it, all of the systems. We need a clear and a compelling vision for what the Bronx will look like, what it will be like to live here when we have a healthy, regenerative, post-fossil fuel economy. And we need a roadmap for how to get there soon because we do not have the luxury of time on our side on this issue. The need to build a community and a plan for community resilience is a commitment of mine as well as an invitation to all of you to consider what it would look like. I suspect that we already have more of the answers surrounding us than we realize, but we have to get started in a very meaningful way. It, I wanted to say this too. I think that giving space and time to dialogues that are entertaining the idea that climate change is not real is a waste of our time. I think we have to move forward anyway. It is okay to disagree and to, um, to, to move on your path, and I think that we should not be afraid of that conflict but because we have too much at stake. So I just want you all to know that I am committed to that as well. I will close by mentioning that it is my understanding that appropriately enough, in order for us to achieve true resilience for our state and for our communities, we first need to master our own inner resilience and how we do the work there. This will be a significant challenge, and it's actually not something that can just be accomplished and we move on from. It's an everyday thing that we have to show up for, but we're up for the task, and we will and can make that commitment. To return very briefly to my story, I want to talk about my experience. Um, I was fortunate to have worked in a number of government roles, as well as a historic presidential campaign before seeking elected office. And I think it helped in my campaign for the Senate to be able to tell these stories to show voters who I am. But I want to be very, very clear that there is absolutely no right kind of experience required to do politics or to run for office. All of our experiences and all of our backgrounds and perspectives are equally important. Any experience that you have serving others is a credible experience if you want to step up to serve your community. In fact, 
I think the people who are deemed inexperienced are very oftentimes the exact voices and the exact people that we need in our political system. A long, <laughs> along with other new members of the legislature this year, I've seen the advantage, advantages that comes from being new, even though there are some disadvantages too. My inexperience allows me to see what is fundamentally wrong about our government and how it works. It is why I've decided not to take meetings off the floor with lobbyists while we're in session um, listening to legislation. If you can imagine that that's radical, but that is the truth. And to instead take advantage of every moment of session to learn and to understand what the arguments are around legislation. And it's why I'm working to bring heightened transparency, particular, particularly around the budget, to District 34. My inexperience drives me to change the practice and the, the practices that I disagree with. Instead of accepting them as simply the way things are done in Albany, which is the mantra that goes on and on and on, this is a way to reject that and to go into a different way because the way it's been done hasn't always worked for all of us. Just as my fresh perspective, though, is valuable, so is all of yours. Every person who gets involved in our politics helps to fill a blind spot, and there are so many blind spots everywhere. So if you have a thought about getting involved or about running for office at some level, I'm calling on you to take that thought seriously. And if you haven't, then I invite you to have that thought for the first time. Because in that room, having nurses and mothers and grandparents and doctors and lawyers and students and on and on and on changes the discussion in a way that we need in order to see that show up in our in our policies and our laws. I began this talk by talking about my family's dinner table, about the ideas that we exchanged across that dinner table, the value given to my voice and the confidence that I gained at that dinner table. And today, as I think about the transformational four months that I've served in the New York State Senate, I want to invite you all to that table. the great big open table of political discourse and activism in our state. We need every single one of your voices, all of your ideas, all of your experiences. It is only when each of us sits at that table that we will be able to create a truly just and joyful world. And I want to end now by telling one more story about Agents of Change. I was lucky to have the support of many high school students on my campaign. Some of you saw them during my inauguration here at Lehman. It's actually one of the most amazing things to look back on because they volunteered their precious summer days, which you know are very precious when you are a teenager, to sit for hours in my campaign headquarters, which was my parents' basement, <laughs> that saw not much sunlight at all, making phone calls or going out into the streets for hours to knock on doors or register voters and to help us get the word out. And sometimes they did it um, and they were met with extreme resistance in the street. As you know, we often say politics is a contact sport. It's like a street fight and it was, it really was, but they showed up and they were very brave. And for most of them, it was the first time that they had ever even been involved in politics at all. But because a friend of theirs had decided to volunteer or learned about the campaign on social media or happened to meet me at the Women's Empowerment Club at their high school, they decided to give politics a try. They collectively embodied the core principles of change I've talked about today. They demonstrated courage by showing up and giving their all, their literal all, to something that many of them had never even tried before. They were resilient, persevering through the inevitable challenges and so many setbacks of any campaign that all campaigns have. And together, we were disruptive, very disruptive. <laughs> and we overturned the status quo. And whether or not they choose to work on another campaign or just make that the only campaign that they've ever worked on, I know that the work that they did in the summer will plant the seeds 
of activism for them in their life and that never again will they be silent when they know that they have to speak up against something that they're seeing that is unjust. Once you see the power that you have to make change in your community, you can never forget it. So I'm gonna end right now with a quote because this is the mantra and the quote that actually guides me when I am at that table with those 38 other state senators and I'm thinking to myself, what I'm hearing right now seems crazy and I have to say something but I am afraid to say something because it's gonna bother some people in this room but it's necessary to say it. And the mantra, which I wound up sharing with my colleagues so that they understood where I was coming from when I was disagreeing with them, is this. The time is always right to do what is right. Thank you so much. I want to thank the Honorable Alessandra Biaggi for, for putting her courage, her conviction, her competitive streak, and her resilience to work for all of us, and for reminding us that disruption is good and the power to disrupt is ours. Thank you very much. Another round of applause. And I would now like to invite all of you for a small reception here behind me. Thank you very much. And remember, Lehman College is your house. Please visit us and visit us often. Thank you. Thank you.